it's a narrow road But the winds are wide And you're good in your promise
great is your faithfulness to me from the rising sun to the setting same I will praise your name great is your
Today, no matter where you are gathered, or how many you're gathered with, you are still His church. You are still His church. God's love hasn't changed. It is unending. It is infinite. It is deep. And believe when I say His love has power today. Power to free you, heal you, and to fill you. And restore you. God's mercy hasn't changed. He keeps no record of wrong. And His mercy is new every morning. The cross hasn't changed. It's still there for you and for me, no matter who you are or what you've done. This is what we need to be reminded of today. That wherever two or more are gathered in His name, Jesus is standing in our midst. This means the church hasn't changed. The church isn't a building. It is you and I together, with the Spirit of God living in us, living through us. So today, as we come together, as we worship. Let us be reminded that we are still His church. God is here with us right now. And no matter what your past looks like or how scary your future may be, you can trust God. You can trust God. And because He is here with us, we have everything we need today. We are still His church. We are still His church. We are still His church. Hey everybody, good morning once again. Welcome back to Insight Church Online. Grateful to be with you as always. Each time we gather, uh, it's a privilege, it's an expression of God's faithfulness and His goodness to keep us uh, day in and day out, week to week. Uh, the faithfulness of the Lord reaches unto the clouds. Friends, it's appropriate for us to say praise the Lord for He is good and his mercy endures forever. Welcome back to Insight Church Online. Thanks for being part of the Insight Church tribe. So grateful for the opportunity to worship with you. Good day, good morning, God morning. Uh, great morning is not enough. I wanna wish you a God morning. Uh, thanks again for being here today. You know, we do need your help. Uh, we're really excited about moving forward uh, into the 
digital mission field, friends, to reach many, many more people. We've been praying and expanding. God is opening some tremendous doors of opportunity for here at Insight Church to reach more people uh, with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, friends. And when I say reach more people, I'm talking exponential growth and uh, reaching millions uh, more people, friends, that uh, some great things are happening here. We'll give you some updates pretty soon of some exciting things to come. But it's your prayers, it's your faithfulness, it's, in, it's your involvement with us in ministry that makes it possible for us to continue to expand and grow. So thank you for being part and being a participant, as we say here at Insight Church, for being all in uh, concerning the mission and the vision that God has given us. Our church is needed. Our church is influencing a generation across the nation and even beyond into other countries uh, because of uh, your involvement with us. So thanks for praying and believing with us. Uh, do go ahead, if you haven't done so, and subscribe to my YouTube channel, friends. Uh, go ahead and click the, the notification bell so that you stay up to date with all the great resources and content. We're uh, planning even more content creation uh, to enrich your life, to enhance your walk with the Lord even more. So you want to make sure that you subscribe to my YouTube so that you can stay connected and copy that link. Go ahead and text or email it to a family member, uh, someone that you know needs the word of God. And I think that just about includes everyone. So please do uh, continue to let your light shine and be an influence, be salt, be light to those around you, friends. Uh, be that beacon of light in a dark world. Uh, Jesus tells us to let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and give glory to our Father in heaven. You know, I'm really excited about um, today's service, friends. We're continuing to focus on the importance of uh, just men's ministry this year, friends. This is the year that uh, the Lord communicated to our hearts to uh, develop and disciple men. We've been focusing on that. And uh, even this, this time of uh, celebrating Father's Day every day, every week, every Sunday is Father's Day for us here at Insight Church. Uh, I'm going to be teaching a little bit later on in the service here online on fearless fathers and uh, communicating to you just really kind of raw and straight up, friends, where we are um, in society today and why fathers, fearless fathers, really represent the last line of defense in protecting our homes and protecting our church from the onslaught of uh, demonic encroachments um, into uh, our families, into the things of God. But remember, Jesus says that the gates of hell cannot, shall not, and will not prevail against the church, friends. That means that uh, we are living victoriously and we will always be victorious in the things of God, but it requires us as fathers to be fearless. And so thanks again, guys, for being such a great example uh, to those around you and how you lead your families and uh, men after God's own heart. Thank you so much. You know, before we get into the word, this is the time for us to sow, for us to invest. We're grateful that our church is really, really rich soil uh, for our tithe and our offerings to be planted in the house of God, friends. Uh, all seed needs good dirt and needs good soil. And God says to bring all the tithe into my house. Uh, let's just say that this is where we plant our tithe and our offering. And Jesus tells us it's not our gift that sanctifies the altar. He says it's the altar that sanctifies the gift, friends. That means that we need to plant and give uh, even more than we think the church needs it. Uh, the church certainly benefits in terms of our mission moving forward, but we need to give, we need to plant, we need to sow for our own benefit so that we can be uh, plugged in to the economy of God and continue to walk in uh, the fullness of his blessing, friends. We're always reminded here at Insight Church, Ephesians 4, 16 tells us that the thing that causes the growth of God's body, of God's church, the body of Christ, the local church body, is when each joint supplies and every part does its share. This is the time for us to do our part, to do our share, friends, and our church will continue to grow uh, because of your faithfulness. Thanks uh, for being a partner with us. Scan the QR code you see on your screen, text to give. Visit our website at insightchurch.org at any time or use your church app uh, to give and to uh, bring your tithe and your offering to the Lord this morning. Thank you. 
We really, really appreciate it. As I said before, the word is going to be rich today. It's going to be, um, let's just say, a little bit edgy, not because of the word, but where we are in society, the kind of darkness that we're facing right now. Uh, folks, it takes boldness. It takes courage, but it also takes uh, love and compassion and sensitivity to preach the truth of God's word as we see uh, more and more conflict between the truth of the scriptures and the reality of the culture in which we live. Friends, it's going to be a tough message, a challenging message, but uh, the truth will be spoken today. And I know that the truth, as Jesus said, uh, the truth alone, he says, it makes us free. We should know the truth and the truth shall make us free. Friends, open your heart. Get ready for another life changing, mind renewing, faith building time in God's word. Take a look at this. I know you're going to be challenged. I know you're going to be changed. I know you're going to be blessed. So let's pray. Ask the Lord for his help and we'll get into the word. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Oh, how we love your Lord is our meditation all the day. And you through your commandments, you make us wiser than our enemies. We ask you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that the entrance of your word gives light and gives understanding to the simple. We ask you to open the eyes of our understanding that we may comprehend the scriptures. Holy Spirit, we honor you. We welcome you as the guest of the hour. You are our parakletos, our comforter, our helper, the one who gives us the advantage in this life, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot see and does not know, but we see you and we know you intimately because you're not only with us, but you're in us. And we ask you this morning that you would increasingly form within each one of us the character and the divine nature of our Lord Jesus Christ and bring about the reality of his kingdom in our lives and through our lives to the world around us. In Jesus' name, we pray everybody wholeheartedly said and agreed. Amen. All right, this get to work this morning. And um, again, happy Father's Day. And I want to talk some about fearless fathers fearless fathers. We're living in an age right now that uh, we need um, men in particular, but also uh, fathers to be, to be fearless. And we'll see um, how I really believe that society is set up to attack fathers and fatherhood more than anything else in our, in our nation. Um, you know, when we teach Mother's Day, it's always, you know, about the sunshine and the flowers and you know, how, how wonderful you are and how special you are. And yet Father's Day tends to be more about discipline and instruction. Um, Father's Day tends to be more about uh, responsibility and hard truth. And I believe that's because of the role that's been given to us. It's because of the assignment that's been given to us. And um, I want to share along those lines again to, to establish the great value of being a godly father um, during this time. And I, I kind of, you know, I'm starting to feel like, a, like an Old Testament prophet, man. Like I'm going to start eating locusts and wild honey and wearing <laughs> old clothes. Just where we are in society, as we continue to, to seek the Lord, our heart is being stirred to, to preach with a prophetic edge and an end time, time edge to speak to the spirit of the day to speak to the, the, the principalities um, that are affecting our nation during this time. So thank you again for uh, your prayers and standing with us. You know, I'm very much a um, uh, kind of uh, geared toward organizational, you know, leadership, um, you know, and pastoring. So take a look at this. Let's review our mission statement. I'd like to start here. I think it's important to know a church's mission statement. If you go to the church and support and serve and give, it's important to know this is, this is our assignment. So our aim here at Insight Church is to make and train followers of Jesus Christ and, very important, to build strong families. It's one of the assignments that God has given to us is to build strong families by understanding, embracing, and doing God's word. Um, that's why the church is called Insight. Insight is the apprehension into the, of the true nature of something. It's understanding so Insight Church is the name that God put in our heart for the church. Understanding, embracing, and doing God's word. And this last phrase here, preparing people for the day of the Lord. We're in a different dispensation. Um, it's, it's much later than it's ever been before. And part of our assignment and our um, prophetic mandate, so to speak, 
is to prepare people for the day of the Lord and the coming of the Lord. It's to help us understand the, the, the sobriety um, of that day um, to, to be like the, the wise virgins and not the foolish virgins, but to prepare our lamps and to see to it that there's oil, that there's provision, that we are waiting for the coming of the bridegroom who will come at an hour that we, we don't expect. And so that's part of our mission here. Let's, let's dig in. This is our, our assignment. And, um, you know, even you read, for example, with the, the seven churches that you read in uh, Revelation, the first few chapters of Revel the book of Revelation, um, to, each, to each church, Jesus made a statement um, of commendation of what the church was doing well, but also what the church was not doing well. And for each church, he made this statement. I know your works. I know your works. In other words, Jesus was paying attention to what the church was doing and gauging and judging whether or not the church was fulfilling its given assignment. For all seven churches, he says, I know your works. And that's something that I believe that's true for us and, every, and everybody um, that, that uh, is, represents the, the, the church of Jesus Christ. So let's get going here. Talking about fearless fathers, because we're called to build strong families, um, I want to expose you ladies and also ex expose our wives and our children uh, somewhat to the vision of, of Insight Men. And uh, this is going to feel like a men's ministry uh, meeting today, a men's meeting today. And here's why. Uh, if we only teach vision for men and for families exclusively in the context of men's ministry, um, how will the rest of the family ever know what to pray for? How will you ever know what to believe for, what to support, and what to protect concerning men and our fathers? So it's important for us to share sometimes in these contexts for um, our, our ladies, our wives, and our children um, our heartbeat for men. Um, if, if you don't understand a biblical model for um, uh, masculinity and manhood in the kingdom, you might treat us like the world treats us and, and misappropriate the gift of having a man of God in the home, in your, in your midst. And so it's important for us to gain some understanding. Uh, without understanding and knowledge of what the Bible says about fathers and fatherhood, we'll never have the opportunity to clearly define biblical standards for marriage and family or be able to replicate a kingdom family model. And furthermore, you may even find yourself working against or undermining something that God has unchangeably established in his creative order. So it's important for us to gain knowledge about uh, masculinity, uh, fatherhood, and what that means from, from a biblical perspective. Um, we're in a time of, of ideological warfare, what I call ideological warfare, and it's a, it's a war of two things, identity and ideas. Society today is defined by identity, a war concerning identity and ideas. You hear more about identity politics and, and group things to shape identity and to shape ideas. That's really where much of the challenges are, are centered in what we see happening in society today. And if we don't have uh, clear concepts of what um, a biblical godly man, godly husband, and godly father looks like, um, you know, ladies, some of, some of you will, will marry any old piece of a man. Come on, just, just to have somebody, just to accommodate loneliness and all those kinds of things. It's important to have clearly identified standards of what a man of God is to be if you are going to submit your life to him for the rest of your life. You need to check him out. Are you with me? So it's important for us to communicate these, these kinds of things. And so, again, it's going to feel like a, like a men's meeting. And I, I pray that we'll leave with greater appreciation of um, the value of godly men and godly fathers and hold them even, in even higher esteem. You know, just yesterday on the, the men's call that we do, I think uh, Elder Carlton, he mentioned that, that Halloween is ranked as a higher uh, holiday than, that's celebrated than Father's Day. Wow. That Halloween is a, is a more, more, more celebrated holiday than, than Father's Day, and that sounds like the devil. <laughs> 
you know. So that just lets you know where society is in terms of this warped, corrupt, uh, misappropriated perspective about the role of a godly man and a godly father. Coming into this year, uh, praying about direction this year, the Lord spoke to our, our hearts to develop and disciple men, um, especially with all the gender confusion that's happening in society. Again, a war over identity and ideas um, to affirm gender distinction in a culture of gender dysphoria, but to also affirm gender facts in a culture of gender fluidity. This is the kingdom of God, and we communicate the truth according to God's word, uh, despite what the culture has to say. God himself made penises and vaginas. Now, if I know that's a little dicey for you, I got to be a dicey, different kind of preacher because that's where we are. So if the culture has enough boldness to have, uh, you know, drag, drag queens teaching our kindergarten students, then the preacher's got to have enough boldness just to speak truth for what it is. You've got to say it. God made penises and, and vaginas. We made them male and female. We're going to see that from the word of God. And it's important for us to make this distinction and to talk about fearless, fearless fathers. Listen, sin makes all of us do what God tells us not to do. And get this, sexual immorality in Scripture includes both heterosexual sins just as much as homosexual sins. It's, just, it's, a, it's a general term for sexual immorality. Include, it includes both. But here's the, here's the distinction. When, when David murdered Uriah the Hittite, and committed sexual immorality with Bathsheba. Watch this. God didn't send fire and brimstone down to burn up the city. Are you hearing me? He committed sexual immorality, and it was a sexual, heterosexual sin. But God didn't rain fire and brimstone down to burn up cities. The consequences for all sins are not equal. The consequences are not equal. Come on, let's, let's get to work here. Take a look at Jude chapter 1, verse 7. We're going to start here talking about fearless fathers and just kind of deal with this, with this gender thing and the role of fathers in society today. Starting at Jude chapter 1, verse 7, it says here, As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, multiple cities around them in similar manner to these, Listen carefully, having given themselves over to sexual immorality. In other words, it was normalized, it was legitimized, and it was legalized. It says these cities gave themselves over to sexual immorality. Stay with me. It says, and gone after strange flesh, it tells us here that those cities are set forth as an example, suffering, big deal, the vengeance of eternal fire. Is that in the word? Yes. Yes. Said they gave themselves over to sexual immorality, normalized, legitimized, legalized. And God says they're set forth as an example for going after strange flesh, as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Take a look at Romans chapter 12, verse 19. It tells us this concerning vengeance. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Now, it's important when the scripture says that those cities were given, given as an example of um, vengeance, the vengeance of eternal fire, and God himself says, Vengeance is mine. I will pay. I'm the one who hands out vengeance. And we have an example of cities who suffered the vengeance of eternal fire because they had been given over to sexual immorality. Ven vengeance is punishment inflicted. And, it's, and it's, it's grave retribution for a serious crime. Are you with me? God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, and we have, we have these cities that have been judged as an example, giving themselves over to sexual immorality, and they suffered the vengeance of eternal fire. Vengeance is punishment inflicted. 
And vengeance is, again, grave retribution or payback for something that was an abomination in the eyes of God. And the word of God says on the scriptures that cannot be broken, that whenever God sees nations that give themselves over to sexual immorality and strange flesh, God says, I've given you a warning of cities that have been burned, that have suffered the vengeance of my wrath because of it. Are you hearing me this morning? All right. So unfortunately, take a look. Unfortunately, America has moved from being one nation under God to being a nation divided, a divided nation under a president. Okay, I'm just going to come right at it today. We, we moved from being one nation under God, and we'll see from the scriptures uh, the attitude of, of the nations today. We've moved from being one nation under, under God to we're now a divided nation under a president. And we'll, you can see this through multiple administrations. Now, take a look here. I want to show you some pictures here. I got a few pictures here. Okay, just hold on with me now. I don't, now I don't, I don't, I have no use for politics. No use. I'm not in anybody's party. I don't fly with anybody's party. I'm going to speak the truth of God's word concerning the kingdom of God. And by God's grace, I'd rather die as a martyr than to pick anybody's political side in this world. So I'm just going to tell the truth. I, I remember this, this picture that you see here on June 26th of 2015. I remember 2015 when I saw that picture for the first time. I cried. I wept. And that was the time when, when um, our former president, President Obama, ordered the White House to be lit up in those rainbow colors um, to celebrate sexual immorality. Now, don't, don't trip, because I would have cried if it was a Republican, if it was Reagan, if it was Trump. I don't care who it was. I, I cried because I understood what that meant eight years ago. Eight years ago. I wept in June of 2015. So eight years later, take a look at this next picture. I got a couple of them here. This happened last Saturday, June 10th. Um, our president, Biden, raised for the first time ever the gay pride flag in a, in a favored position above the American flag. There are protocols about how you handle the American flag. That's, that's a place of primary importance in between two American flags. Come on now, keep your mind back to Jude when God says, whenever you give yourself over to sexual immorality, I've given you an example of the vengeance that's going to come by my wrath. So for the first time, we see that a, that a flag was, was raised. I, I have to speak this way for the sake of our children and our grandchildren. And as I said before, if we're living in a time where the drag queens are teaching our preschool and kindergarten kids, I'm, get, I'm going somewhere with this. It's the dads that's got to step up, and we got we to be fearless during this time. Can't count on the government. We wouldn't do that anyway, but I'm telling you what's, what's happening in our, in our society today. This is not a political issue. It's a spiritual issue. It's a spiritual issue of what we see happening in our nation today. Well, Pastor James, you know, I just came to hear a good Father's Day message. <laughs> this is a great Father's Day message. <laughs> this is what fatherhood is all about. This is what fatherhood is all about. This has to do with our, our purpose. Somebody say amen. amen. It has to do with being a, a man of God, a, a father in the home. Any, any old dog can produce puppies. Any old dog can produce puppies. But we're talking about why we honor godly fathers in the church and in the kingdom of God in the times in which we, which we live. So it's not, a, it's not a political thing. Let's go back to that picture of the flags. I got a, I got a couple more here. The picture of the flags. Listen, one of, one of the things that broke my heart, because I listened to the video, and again, I hope you hear my heart. I'm not talking about a personality I'm not wrestling against flesh and blood right now. I'm talking about a spirit that's at work in our age. One of the things that's, that's really 
uh, disturbing about this is during, during the speech that President Biden made, he said out of his own mouth that the people in the transgender community are the bravest people he's ever known. He said it in his speech. You're the bravest people I've ever known. And I thought to myself, when the commander in chief of the United States Armed Forces, who sent men and women to the other side of the planet, at his word, who are willing to die for him and his policy, for him to make a statement that they're the bravest people that he's ever known when he's the Kent commander in chief, that's, that's, an, out, that's an outrage. Amen. When men and women are willing to die at the word and the discretion of the president, and to not mention them and to say that the transgender community are the bravest people you've ever known. Take a look at the next picture. That's, that's our president. I, I just made it a little decent there. This is just, this is just in, internet stuff. It's, it's out there. It was all over the cable news network. That's, that's, that's a guy, that's a dude, folks, who became a woman by the name of Rose Montoya on the lawn of the White House that just exposed himself, herself, what have you. Next picture. And here's a picture of the president taking a selfie. Eager. The, the president of the United States of America and the leader of the free world. Remember we read God says when you give your those cities that gave themselves over to sexual immorality and strange flesh. That's good. Yeah, take a look at the next picture here. This Rose, he, you know, he, she, whatever, is a, is a um, TikTok personality and said here, I had the honor of attending the White House Pride, the largest one in history, where the Pride flag flew for the first time. This is trans joy. We're here at the White House, unapologetically trans, queer, and brown, and, and there is the leader of our nation taking a selfie and celebrating something that God says, I'm going to pour out my vengeance for that. Now, I know it's, I know it's difficult, and I'm not trying to stir anything up, but some, some of us, and I'll generalize, some of us Christians, generally speaking, have to repent for how we vote. And I'm just, I'm just going to leave that out there. I'm not, I'm not talking to anything or to anybody. I'm just saying this is where we are in society today, that this was elected. And I'm, I'm here to preach the truth of God's word, that God says that when I see nations that have handed themselves and given themselves over, to sexual immorality, normalized, legitimized, legalized, and strange flesh. He says, I've given you an example of cities that burn with fire and the vengeance of my eternal wrath. Somebody say amen. amen. I, was, I was praying earlier this week and I felt the Lord spoke to me about this whole incident and told me that the, our president opened a spiritual gateway for unprecedented demonic power to flow into our nation. He welcomed them in. And the judgment of God is pending on our nation. That's why we go and do National Prayer Altar and we, we stand and we go to D.C. to stand and to petition God and stand in the gap for this nation. Are you hearing me? He's, he says he's a Catholic. President Obama said he was a Christian. And I'm not judging or I'm not, I hope you hear my heart. I'm just not in that, in the weeds. I'm just saying when you make a profession that you're a Christ follower or, or what have you, did you not read the book of Jude when God, what book are you reading? 
Folks, I'm telling you where our, where our nation is, and, and this, is, this, is why, this is why we need fearless fathers. Yeah. Coming at this from a different, different angle, if you have a man of God anywhere close to you in your home, I'm telling you, man, this is the time to honor him. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I don't want to take the long, long route. All of this, this stuff, and again, I'm going to distinguish. I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about the identity and the ideology of transgenderism. I'm not talking about people. Please hear my heart. I want to be precise and surgical how I deal with this. I am not talking about people. I'm talking about the ideology. But you know what? That ideology of, of transgenderism, it had to be preceded, and it was preceded by two things. Number one, it was preceded by cultural feminism. It was preceded by cultural feminism, and that whole narrative of, watch this, toxic masculinity. So this, this, this campaign started to go through our culture that men are bad, men are toxic. Now, I know men have done some goofy stuff and some dumb stuff. Absolutely. But it starts with this idea of, of cultural feminism and toxic masculinity. Let me, just, let me just kind of go ahead and break it down here. Now, the second wave that opened the door for transgenderism, watch this is to marry gay rights to civil rights. So now the narrative about race and racism, it was all so skillfully blended together that the, the, the idea of cultural feminism and the social justice movement and marrying gay rights to uh, uh, voting rights and civil rights and tying it all in with race and the division between black people and white people. Listen to me. It all became a Trojan horse for America, and the transgenderism stuff was on the inside of the Trojan horse. Come on, are you, are you with me this morning? I'm telling you, these, these things opened the way for, for the transgenderism movement to land on the White House lawn. I, I can almost guarantee you, you're not going to hear as much about racism anymore. Come on now, come on now. I, I, probably not going to hear as much because mission accomplished. They use that to get what? The only answer is, is the kingdom of God. The only answer is the kingdom of God. Come on, I'm telling you how in the last days the Spirit expressly says that men will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Those are the times that we're, we're living in right now. I know, I know this is different. It's supposed to be different. We need something different. God called us to communicate something different. Let's go here. Let's keep going here. Our, our, our Heavenly Father, now with all of the things that we just shared and we talked about the judgment the vengeance of God and his eternal wrath, despite that and what we see happening in our nation. Let's, let's affirm the love of God. We know, we know this. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Listen at this. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government. Everybody say government. government. And the government will be upon his shoulder, not a president. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Get this, everlasting father, prince of peace, and again, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. It's not going to be any end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establishment, establish it with judgment and justice. So you're talking about the advancement of the kingdom of God, the zeal of the Lord of hosts, Jehovah, Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of heaven's armies, the commander of heaven armies, heaven's armies will perform this. That's a statement of war. Whenever the Bible talks about the Lord of hosts, it's talking about God as a man of war and says he's going to perform the advancing of his kingdom, the increase of his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and with justice. Remember, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. Keep that in mind. Let's go to Psalms 2. 
very important. Psalms 2 verse 1 from the New Living Translation says this, why are the nations so angry? Why do they waste their time with futile plans? Verse 2, the kings of the earth, the political rulers of the earth, prepare for battle. The rulers plot together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Here's their statement in verse 3. Let us break their chains, they cry, and free ourselves from slavery to God. It's a statement of the nations declaring war against God to say we don't want to be a nation under God. We don't want to, we don't want to be enslaved to the word of God. We don't want to be enslaved to uh, God's way of living and God's uh, rules and his uh, standards and judgments for our life. It says that the leaders of the world are going to gather in rebellion to declare war against God. Uh, verse 4, but the one who rules in heaven laughs. <laughs> the Lord scoffs at them. Verse 5, then in anger he rebukes them, terrifying them with his fierce fury. Folks, I'm talking about the pending judgment of God for nations and societies that rebel against him and, and declare handing themselves over to strange flesh and giving themselves over to sexual immorality. Despite all of that, we know John 3.16, which tells us here still that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That the father gives his son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That even now, God's love, his, his care for people, his compassion, his long suffering is not condemnation, but he's giving people the opportunity to still come to faith in his son, that even now God is withholding his judgment in his mercy, in his long suffering, for there to be time for people to repent of their sin and to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Aren't you thankful for God's mercy? When we seem to be doing everything we can to expedite his judgment, and yet God is merciful. He's long-suffering. Somebody say amen. amen. 2 Peter 3, 9. Listen at this. It says the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness, but again, it says it here. He's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Even now, that is God's desire for our nation. Romans 10, 13 says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That God desires to save Rose Montoya. Yeah. Jesus loves him or her, and so do I. So do you. And yet God has compassion and a deep desire for there to be repentance. You know, we, 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 the, challenge, the challenge with Pride Month, number one, the Bible doesn't have anything good to say about pride. Come on, we just read Psalm 2. It's defiance against God. I, I, we, we need humility month. The challenge, the challenge with, with Pride Month is that the challenge with Pride Month is you see the picture in Luke 15 of what the Bible calls the prodigal son or the lost son. It was, it was humility. And the word of God literally says when the lost son came to himself, he came back to the Father. It was not pride. It was not arrogance. It was a heart that was soft toward the Father, and the door was there for the Father to welcome him back into the family and to honor him. But it was humility. It was not pride. And that is the crisis of us as believers and even pastors signing on to promote this agenda in society. It gives no provision for people to ever find a place of humility and repentance for the Father to welcome them back into the, into the family of God and to forgive them of their sins. It's why we have to, we have to hold a line and hold a standard. Somebody say amen. amen. I, don't, I don't think it's any, any, any coincidence that Pride Month happens in the same month as Father's Day. 
Now, let's go a little further because I want, I want, you, I want to show you that transgender ideology is an attack on fatherhood. It's an attack on fatherhood. This is why, and it's a different Father's Day message. This is just kind of different. <laughs> this one's different. I'm going to show you how this movement is an attack on fatherhood. Our, our father, our heavenly father, he, his arms are still open wide, even now, lovingly waiting for bo- broken people to come to him and to receive his love and his forgiveness by offering them salvation and eternal life through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. It's our, it's our mandate to deliver that message and that word and to continue to preach the gospel at every single opportunity and to be witnesses for the Lord at every opportunity because people need the Lord. Yes. He loves them. Yes. He cares about them. Many of them have a call on their life, have even an anointing on their life that God desires. And there's a reclamation of seeing people turn from the power of Satan unto God. Are you with me this morning? Yes. Come on, this is, this is where we live. We got to be a different kind of church, a different kind of body today. Listen, real quick, the kingdom culture uh, versus the culture that we, we live in today. The kingdom versus the culture. Psalm, Psalms 12, verse 1. We look at this a lot in men's ministry. Psalm uh, 12, verse 1 says this, says, uh, help, Lord, for the godly man ceases. Isn't that interesting? Help, Lord. Why? The godly man where are they? And you know, whenever godly men are not around, you need to call on God. <laughs> this is why we need fearless fathers, and we have, we have to honor the men of God. And our church, it says, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. That whenever godly men are not in the forefront, forefront leading in positions of strength, it puts society in a position that... Uh, God is needed. His help is needed. There there are three autonomous uh, entities that we see in Scripture, the individual, the family, and the church. The individual, the family, and the church, and godly men are needed in each one of them to carry out God's kingdom purposes. And when I say autonomous, I'm talking about areas where the government has no business in your individual life, in your family, or in our church. No business. Autonomous. And we need to see to it that, that our, our men are honored in, these, in these, these institutions. And all of these institutions are being assaulted by society. And it's by design. You have, you have to minimize and label men as being toxic first before these agendas can move forward in society. And our society is being conditioned. First John 519, Passion Translation, says we know that we are God's children and that the whole world lies under the misery and the influence of the evil one. We're talking about Satan's involvement in society, except in our hearts, in our home, and in our church. Except there. Malachi chapter 4, verse 6. We know this when it says here, and he will turn the hearts of who? To who? And the hearts of the to their who? Otherwise, or less, God says, I come and strike the earth with a curse. The God makes it clear. He says, if, if help man, Psalms 12, 1, help man for the godly, help Lord for the godly man ceases, tells us here that if I can't get fathers and children reconciled and have uh, men influence, leading and guiding their families with authority, God says the curse is going to come. And that's what we see happening all over society right now, the pending judgment of God. Listen, God says, I need, I need godly men to help me save the world and save societies. I need godly fathers to partner with me to help, to help that to, to transpire. The last line of defense against hell's assault on individuals, families. Next slide. The, the last line of defense against hell's assault on individuals, families, and the church is men of valor. The last line of defense, men of, men of valor. We're, 
we're at war. We're called to be warriors and protectors, to be defenders, to be providers. This is the assignment that God has given to, to men of God. It's, it's tougher than it's ever been before, but you know what? We're stronger than we've ever been before. We're, we're, graced, we're graced for this. Listen, transgenderism, again, the ideology and not the people is an attack on family God's way. And it seeks to undermine God's assignment for fathers. Amen. Come on, I'm lifting, lifting the hood. We're not ignorant of the devil's devices. It's, a, it's an attack on family God's way. It's not political. Please, please hear me. This is not political. It's not cultural. It's spiritual. Yep. In its attack on family, God's way, on his plan to procreate and to populate eternity. And it's an, it's an attack on the father's assignment. Let, let me prove to you when I said before that transgenderism is an attack on, on fatherhood specifically. I'll tell, tell you why. Isn't it, isn't it fascinating that um, every time um, a man emits during sexual intercourse, Every, every time that man, this is crazy, has the potential to produce 200 million children every time. 200 million sperm every time a man emits in sexual intercourse. Every time he is capable of, of producing 200 million children. If there were 200 million eggs, are, are you hearing me? Yeah. Some of y'all think, Lord, I only got one child. Oh, got <laughs> Two is tough. But come on, I'm, I'm talking, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you how much God loves godly seed. He, he made the two to become one because he desires godly seed. Let me tell you how much God loves children. Every time a man emits, God says there's 200 million potential. Now, one of that 200 million made it to the egg. That was you. So we, we, say, we say it this way. Out of all 200 million, you won the race. And so we say you are a winner by nature because you wouldn't be here if you didn't win. You beat everybody else. That's why you're there and why you're listening to me today. You won. You won. Now, here's the interesting thing. Biologically speaking, the gender of a child comes from the sperm, from the male seed, and not from the egg. So get this. Because you beat the others and you showed up and you made it to the egg first, you were either carrying an X chromosome or a Y chromosome. So if you're male, it's because you were the male that got there first. If you're, if, if, if you're female, you're female because you got there first. And if, and if it's an XX chromosome, it's a female. If it's an XY chromosome, it's a male. Let's just say God, our heavenly father, partnered with your natural daddy to determine your sex at conception. Somehow, someway, God partnered with your dad. And God had a hand in determining if the X or the Y got there first to determine your gender. And so when this movement comes about to change trans or across or different genderism, you're talking about an attempt to change what God sovereignly decided in partnership with your father. Are you hearing me? Yes. That's why it's, it's an attack. It's an attack on, on fatherhood. It's an attack on fatherhood. It's not, it's not political. 
It's not cultural. It's a spiritual issue. And it's why God looks at these kinds of things and he makes declarations over societies in terms of his vengeance and his judgment that comes upon society when we start tampering with the sovereignty of God for his own purposes. God partnered with our, our biological father. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise the name of Jesus. We have to be fearless fathers today. We, we provide covering for individuals. We provide leadership for our families. We, uh, the church of Jesus Christ is under our collective stewardship. And as priests in our families and in our communities, our voice carries our vision and our values which represents God's vision and his values, not the government. And I'm telling you again, this is not a cultural thing. I have to, you know, deal with a, you know, basketball player sometime. You know, he helped his uh, son, I think, transition into a daughter. And, like, this is bravery now. He said, this is what fatherhood is all about. No, absolutely, absolutely not. Amen. We, need, we need fearless fathers today and men of God who will stand in the place of authority and represent the plans and the purposes of God. Can you say amen? amen? I'll give you a couple more here. I have too much to share. Uh, let's take look quickly at Matthew chapter 8, beginning at verse 9. A few things here. It says here, uh, this is this Roman centurion speaking to Jesus. He says here, I am a man. I also am a man under authority. A man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes unto my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found, very interesting, such great faith, not even in Israel, because of a man who was under authority. Being under authority gives us great faith, and it gives us great confidence. Take a look at 1 John 5, 3 tells us here about being under the authority of God's word, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, that were submitted to the authority of God's word, and his commandments are not burdensome. Verse 4, for whatever is born of God, get this, overcomes the world. So where the things that we see in society today, the ideologies, the attack on manhood, the attack on fatherhood, the attack, the attack on gender and the fact that God made them male and female, it says whenever we are born of God and we're submitted under the authority of God's word, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world and all of its ideologies, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, what? Our faith. And verse 5 tells us here, who is he who overcomes the world but he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God? I'm talking about men submitted to the word of God, men of faith, fearless fathers in the home that are authorized, we're authorized to overcome the world by faith. Amen. Authorized, empowered to overcome the world by faith in all of its ideologies. It's interesting here we see that what happens in a man's life when we're not submitted. I'll just give you this in Genesis 3, 7. You see Adam here disobeying God, not living under the authority of God's word, of course, in verse 6. And it says here in verse 7, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. When the scripture says here that both of them, their eyes were open, I just say they became woke. That's what all of a sudden now they got a revelation, eyes are open, all of a sudden they get it says their eyes were open after they rebelled and disobeyed God. Then their eyes were open. And they knew that they were naked. Interesting. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. In other words, when they became woke and enlightened or whatever you want to call it, they decided they were going to fix things their way. And they decided they're going to sew some fig leaves together to cover, watch this, in an attempt to propitiate and make atonement for their own sins without, without God's involvement, not knowing that from the time they pulled those fig leaves off the vine, they were already dying. 
There was no life. There was no life in them. It was useless. It says in verse 9, then the Lord God, to God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? Speaking to mankind here. So he said, I heard your voice in the garden. First emotion that we see, we see here, he says, I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. That after sinning against God and supposedly becoming enlightened, the first emotion that you see is fear and shame operative in his lives. And there's, there's nothing that the enemy uses more in the lives of us men than fear and shame and even past failures and past mistakes to undermine our authority and who we are and the role that God has called us to. We try to sow fig leaves and cover things up with sports and motorcycle rides and new cars and car shows and all kinds of things. All kinds of things, an attempt to propitiate and to atone for, for the sins that are operative in our lives. I'll give you one more verse of scripture here. Uh, just says here, a few more here, Genesis 3.21. Of course, they tried to cover up with fig leaves, but then 3.21 tells us this. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics, get this, of skin and clothed them. So instead of them covering up with fig leaves, it says God now implements the shedding of blood to cover them with skin. Watch this, to clothe them, not to cover them. And it's a picture of the foreshadowing of Jesus Christ himself being sacrificed as the, as the animal or the lamb of God and his blood being shed to clothe us from our sins and for us to not be covered with fig leaves. Take a look at another passage of scripture that makes this clear. Zechariah chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of God and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? In other words, I'm pulling this one out. I'm snatching this one out from destruction, from the vengeance of my destruction. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Then, the, then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him saying, the Lord is speaking, take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, see, I have removed your iniquity from you and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head so they put a clean turban on his head and they put clothes on him and the angel of the Lord stood by. You see a picture of God's righteousness reclaiming and redeeming this man from his shame and from the filthy garments that he was wearing. Isaiah 61 10, God says again, says here again, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. I'm not covering up with fig leaves, but God has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. I believe the Lord is speaking this, this next verse to us. Matthew chapter 10, verse 27, for those of us who are called to be fearless fathers, during a time that Society is attacking masculinity, attacking the family, attacking the church. We need fearless men. And Jesus makes this statement. He says, whatever I tell you in the dark, he says, speak it in the light. He says, and whatever you hear in the ear, Jesus says, boldly, Go up on the highest rooftop and preach it from the housetops. And he tells us here in verse 28, and don't fear those who can kill the body, but they can't kill your soul. Rather, fear him who is able both to destroy the soul and the body in hell. I believe Jesus is speaking to us as fearless fathers today to say, men of God, 
what I'm telling you in the dark, this is the time for you to speak it in the light. And what you've heard in the secret of, of the ear, what you hear in your prayer closet, what you hear from intimacy with God, preach it from the housetops and don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. That is my word to the fathers today. Number one, don't be afraid. Be a fearless man of God. You are God's assignment to protect the, uh, to protect the autonomy of your, not only your life, but your family and our church. No fear. No fear. And we have no fear of those who can kill the body because of our fear of the Lord. And ladies, I want to encourage you children, if you have a man of God in your home, in your life, Honor him. Celebrate him. We are made in God's image. And even as God is greatly to be praised, men have a desire to be praised and to be honored and respected because we're made in his image. Thank the Lord that God has given us some fearless fathers to stand against the the challenge and the spirit of our day. You get anything out of the word of God this morning? Praise the name of Jesus. Well, friends, I really want to encourage you, friends, into uh, the place of boldness, the place of humility, yet the place of boldness to stand firm upon God's word, friends. I do uh, mean it when I say a place of humility, friends. Humility is submitting to the scriptures, submitting to what it is that God has to say, submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and to God our Father, friends. I mentioned in the teaching that uh, you know, there was a time when America, uh, we prided ourselves. We took great pride and great um, esteem in being one nation under God. Uh, but more and more as we distance ourselves, as people cast off restraint and reject uh, the truth of God's word and faith in Jesus Christ, we're becoming um, a nation divided under presidents and politicians and uh, socio-political ideologies instead of being one nation under God, friends. And it's no surprise to me that the more we move from God, the more divided we become as a nation, friends. The the more uh, challenges we face relationally, friends, because our unity uh, comes through faith in the Lord and his word. But we're seeing uh, the common denominator of faith in God and uh, standing on God's word is quickly eroding and diminishing in our nation. Uh, We need to continue to pray, friends. We need you to be involved with us. When you hear about uh, National Prayer Altar at Museum of the Bible, this is why we physically go to D.C. to stand in our nation's capital at the gates of our nation, friends, the seat of power uh, just just down the street from the Capitol building and not too far from the White House because we are standing in the gap before the Lord on behalf of our nation, friends. And we need your support. We need your involvement and your continued prayers. I just want to say again, uh, fathers, be fearless. As I shared in the message today, uh, be bold to be a a protector, not only of your own heart, but be a protector of your family. Uh, Be a protector of the church of Jesus Christ, of Insight Church. And uh, let's boldly declare like Joshua uh, 24, 15. He says this, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, friends. That means that not the government nor the president, nor the devil himself, nor any entertainer or any social figure, no celebrity or social icon uh, will allow, will be allowed to inject their values and their vision into our homes, into our lives, into our church. Our vision, our values uh, come exclusively from the word of God uh, being born uh, into the family of God as followers of Jesus Christ, disciples of Jesus Christ. Be encouraged Uh, These are tough times in which we live, but uh, we're graced and we're anointed for the times that we live in. And uh, by God's grace, we'll always commit to you here at Insight Church to teach the truth of God's word and to speak the truth in love. That's our commitment to you. Thanks for being a giver, being a partner, being involved with us. Again, uh, scan the QR code that you see there, text to give, use your church app or visit our website at insightchurch.org or mail your support in. Uh, to help us uh, gather and provide provision for the vision that God has given us here at Insight Church. We need your help. 
we're so grateful. Before we go, I want to speak the blessing of God over you, if I may, by saying to you and to your family, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, friends, and give you his peace in Jesus name. Always remember Jesus loves you. Pastor Sharon and I love you. Be well, be encouraged. I'll see you next time. God bless. Battles. That's who he is, yeah. Jehovah needs to fight your battles.